Okay, we are in session six, in which we're going to address specifically chapter five of the Epistle of the Hebrews. And just by way of a little bit of review for those that have joined us recently, Hebrews is considered the riddle, if you will, of the New Testament. The authorship is anonymous, and we take for granted, in fact, I think I can remove all doubt, if you want to take the time on it, that Paul wrote it. But that's debated by some. He didn't sign it for some very good reasons. Many scholars spend their efforts supporting various conjectures, and it's very interesting as I study those conjectures, the ones that really understand the book are the ones that also happen to recognize Paul's authorship. That might be unrelated, it may be operative, but in any case, we do know the author had a vast knowledge of the Old Testament, but he also was a Hellenistic Jew, and he recognized the people he's writing to were believers, that's very important to understand, and they, they were, uh, had much they're facing a lot of very serious persecution, and that's what he is dealing with there. Some of the issues are the nature of the warnings. The book is built around five warnings. Many people that study the book misunderstand. They see those warnings as interruptions. No, they are really the pivotal points the author's making. But in any case, you want to understand those warnings as we go. You need to understand to whom it was written. Let's not for you, th you may think I'm overemphasizing this. All through the letter, it's clear that he's writing to Jewish believers. He puts himself in with them, we, us, etc., all the way through it. And the real thrust of this epistle is to, it plugs a hole, a huge hole, in the typical Christian's profile of what he believes. Because too much in our culture, if you accept Jesus Christ and you become justified by faith, that's the end of the road in most people's perspective, not realizing, no, that's just first base. And that's what this, this is, the real thrust of Hebrews is going to, uh, I'll show you, is your inheritance. You can't lose your salvation, but you can miss an opportunity to inherit things that are fantastic that God has for you, for, the, for, for those that are faithful. So we're going to talk about the dangers being presented for not persevering to the end. Finishing well is the name of the game. Now, the source of the difficulties is that the kingdom is the central theme of all Scripture. The kingdom of heaven. God, Christ's kingdom on the earth. And one reason the book is so misunderstood is so many scholars are amillennial in their perspective. They assume it's allegorical. Allegories are a license to invent. No, we take the Bible seriously and we think God means what He says and says what He means. And if so... This book is a cornerstone of the, of, of, uh, of the kingdom that's coming. And this, the tragedy is that denom most denominations that come out of the Re Reformation uh, have, uh, have a vestige of amillennial attitudes about the kingdom. And as a result, they'll be blind to what this book is really talking about. Amillennium is not a peripheral issue. My dear friend Walter Martin used to regard, he, uh, he was premillennial, but he regarded eschatology in general as peripheral theology, shouldn't divide fellowship. And he's right about that. But amillennial is the first wire in the road, and if you're amillennial, you'll miss a great deal of what God has here for you. There's more prophecy about the millennium than any other period of time in the entire Bible. It's not just Revelation 20. It's all through it. And it's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. I taught the millennium for many years. Uh, I've always been premillennial. But... Uh, in, in, but I've never, I never connected the dot. I never re until recently recognized that it's the, it's, the Davidic, it's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. That changes the perspective. It's our inheritance, not our justification. Our justification by, Christ's, by, by our faith in Christ alone is taken for granted throughout this entire epistle. Yeah, that's not an issue. Our inheritance is. And it's, it, the, our inheritance will be a result of our faithfulness and our obedience. So we want to find out what that's all about. I also want to highlight Rademacher's model for salvation, which I think is also a key to understanding. That is that salvation has three tenses, past, present, and future. A past tense is our separation from the penalty of sin. We call that justification. The present tense is separation from the power of sin. And as believers, we, have, we can call on the Holy Spirit to give us power over sin. And our, the future tense, of course, is our separation from even the presence of sin. And when we at at, at the uh, with our resurrection bodies and the rest of it, so past tense justification, present tense really called sanctification, and glorification. 
We encourage our students in the Institute to use those terms, not salvation is, is, is uh, too broad to be uh, precise enough. So all three of these are simply elements, past, present, and future, of what we collectively call salvation. Okay. The major pillars of Jerusalem, the, the author is going to go through and attack the major pillars of Judaism. He's talking to Jewish believers and reminding, of reminding them of things that they should already know. That Judaism is not the answer, Christ is. And he institutes five warnings. And the issue in each of the five warnings is ultimately our inheritance, not our justification. And uh, he's going to introduce a new priesthood, a new covenant. Then he's going to go through a, a, a whole, what we call the hall of faith, the heroes of the past. And, uh, and the real goal is, is to become a metakoi, an overcomer, the partaker in Christ. And uh, so... The first seven verses are just going to present Jesus as a new and better deliverer. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. A greater leader than Joshua. But in interspersed here, we'll discover warnings, five warnings. We've had two of them already. We're going to get to the third one tonight. But uh, we're going to talk about the, the priest better than Aaron. And then the, the warning number three of the five is the big one. That's the riddle that has many, many Christians confused uncertain, lying awake nights, if you will. And we'll try to deal with that. And uh, warning number three. When we get to chapter eight, it'll shift. We'll t start talking about the, co the very thing that gives the New Testament its name, that we're in a new covenant with a better sanctuary and a better sacrifice. And then the, then the epistle will shift to practical applications of all of this. And that's where we get the, the fourth warning, the hall of faith, exhort exhortation to endurance, and then the fifth warning. So that's a quick snapshot of where we are. The, when we started out, the first chapter uh, establishing the Son of God's superiority over the, initially the angels, um, it's interesting that every point that was made, I won't go through them again, but the one I want to make is every one of these is supported by Scripture. The writer here is not relying on any apostolic authority, even though he could in a sense. He deliberately did not sign it because he didn't want to uh, he, he saw Christ himself as the apostle to the Jews. That's the way he deals with them. And the only place in the Bible where it speaks of Jesus as the apostle is in this epistle because the writer is regarding him as the apostle, the writer being the apostle to the Gentiles, namely Paul. But in any case, what's interesting, every point he makes is built on a foundation that his listeners have accepted. They're Jews. They know their Old Testament. And every point he made in the first chapter, we had seven different quotes from seven different uh, places in the Old Testament making those points. That'll be a style all the way through. And he goes through and highlights, we, last time we talked all the way, Moses and Christ are contrasted, and, and I won't go through all those again. And the seven proofs of his superiority, that's where he, he, he positions Christ as an apostle to the Jews in contrast to Moses as an apostle to Jews. In each case, of course, Jesus obviously deliberately eclipsing all of these. And uh, so... Moses was, after all, just a servant in his house, and, <laughs> and Jesus is the son that inherits. There's uh, one thing that came up in earlier chapters where God swore. Not very often does God swear an oath, but he swears an oath in his wrath that they, people involved, shall not enter into my rest. And that is, was leaned upon, especially last time. And what do we mean by his rest, and how is that used? They shall not enter my rest. And uh, we'll, talk, we'll give you just a quick summary. And you remember in, at the provocation in, in uh, Numbers 13, they were confronted with the opportunity to get, go enter the land, and 10 spies said, gee, they, rec they reconnoitered for four, 12 guys for 40 days. The 10 guys came back and said, hey, we can't handle it. They're too big for us. Joshua and Caleb said, come on, God's on our side. They, they folded. They, they didn't have the, the faith to go in. So God took an oath and... Uh, so told the ones that didn't go, that generation was going to pass away during those 40 years. It's their children that would inherit the possession of the land. And over a million were saved out of Egypt. I point out to you, there are only two inherited land. But uh, Psalm 95 was a pivotal uh, reference for that whole uh, business. And of course, that's where God, the, in, the, in the time of David, that oath that God made about disinheriting them is renewed in David's time through Psalm 95 and is quoted by the writer to Hebrews 
So that brings us up to date. So let's talk about these rests. The original rest, of course, was God's rest that was instituted in Genesis 2 too, when he rested. The concept of rest isn't relaxation. The concept of rest means the cessation of works. His works were completed, so he rested. It wasn't that he was tired. It was that his job was done. You see the difference? It's important to understand that. We hear rest. We think, well, we, visu you know, we vis uh, visualize a hammock or something. No, no, no. The idea is that he, he finished his task. He met his objectives. Okay. Well, that Canaan rest is what occurs, of course, in Numbers 13 and 14. That's where they get to, they, they've, been, they've been saved out of Egypt, Red Sea, all of that. And they've now got the opportunity to enter the land, and they failed to do it. They haven't got the, the faith to go forward. And so that's when, the, the, to, to, to earn their Canaan rest. They had a task to go to take over the land. They didn't do it. And so they are relegated to 38 years of wandering, a 38-year detour for an 11-day journey. And uh, that, that there's a lesson. What we're interested in isn't just the history. It's a lesson for us because the writer to Hebrews is applying this not just to them then, but to his listeners at the time. And uh, this whole idea was renewed, in effect, in David through Psalm 95. And that offer is still open. If, if you accomplish what, that which God has for you to do, you can enter into his rest. You've done what he's told you to do, whether it's entering the land or whatever. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, for the Hebrew Christians, this, of course, is being offered to them in, in uh, Hebrews 4. Now, it's interesting, by the way, those that were Hebrews that were Christians, um, when Christ was speaking, that was A.D. 32 that, uh, that were at the end of his ministry. And if they are faithful, they will end up being, don't go back to Judaism or you'll die because they're gonna, the, the, the fall of Jerusalem is coming. If they're faithful, they will be like the rest of the Christians and go to Pella, east of the Jordan, like Christ instructed to them in Luke 21. And Eusebius writes that when Jerusalem fell, over a million people were killed, men, women, and children. No Christians were. Why? Because they followed their directions. Well, it's interesting that same today that was 38 years for the, the, uh, the generation in Canaan is also is 38 years for the generation that's listening to the original listeners to this epistle. It's 40 years nominally, 38 years precisely. Where do I get that Deuteronomy 2.14? But anyway, now for us then, what is that rest? Well, that's the millennial rest, our, our inheritance that's awaiting us if we're faithful. Faithful doing what? Ah, that's glad you asked. That's what the epistle is all about. So we have past tense rest, that's justification rest. All of you should be in justification rest because if you've trusted Christ, he did 100% of what's needed. You are saved. You, your, your passport to, to heaven is stamped. Okay, you can enter. You may enter, but you don't inherit what do you inherit? That depends on your maturity, spiritual maturity. How much, you, how, how, how far have you grown? You say you're saved, what have you done with it? That's the question that'll be asked at the judgment seat. So in the future sense, of course, it's our kingdom inheritance. And most of us probably don't, let, that should be prioritizing our lives. For most of us, it's an academic abstraction. No, no, no. It should be the primary yardstick that we measure every decision, everything we do. Is, is, uh, is, 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 is to preserve that inheritance. Okay, well, the first seven chapters, we've, uh, you know, is, is the region we're in. Better than angels, better than Moses, better than Joshua, better than Aaron. Those are the buildups in his basic fabric. But the three warnings are the key points, and we're going to encounter the preamble to the third warning tonight. Because when we get to the end of chapter 5, the setup for the warning is there. And that's going to be the peak tonight. Later on, uh, in subsequent sessions, of course, we'll get through the other better covenant practical applications and so on. So we're going to go from chapter 4 to chapter 5 up to chapter 6 tonight to get a perspective. And now he's going to address the, major, the next major pillar of Judaism. We talked about angels. We talked about Moses. Now we're going to talk about the Levitical priesthood. And that's a big topic. In fact, he's going to set it up, give us a warning. We'll talk about the warning then from chapter 7 to 10, the priesthood is the pivot to the whole epistle, surprisingly enough. Prophet and priest. There's a difference between a prophet and a priest. That's the direction of the communication. Who's dialing who, right? A prophet is God's representative to the people, right? He exhorts and presents God. The priest presents the people to God. 
Here's the way I decided it. I thought this maybe do it. The, the prophet is God's presentation to the people. The priest presents the person to God. So that's, that's a way to view their roles and missions, if you will. In our case, Christ is both, right? Of course. But, uh, okay, we actually made it to the first verse of, of um, the chapter 9. I'm, we're we're ahead, of the, ahead of the power curve. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, For every high priest taken from among men, notice he's from men, he has to be a man, Christ can be our high priest because he's a man, right? Is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who gave us the most ultimate sacrifice? It wasn't Aaron. It was Christ. Who can have compassion for the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself is also, is also compassed with infirmity. In other words, a good priest knows where you're at. So to speak, he, he, he can sympathize. He can understand. And Christ indeed can. Why? Because he's, he not only created you, he's a man himself. And by reason thereof, he ought, as for the people, he also for himself to offer for sins. Now that's referring, of course, to Aaron, because Aaron could offer sins for himself, offerings for sins. Christ didn't need to. He was sinless. He offered himself, actually. And no man taketh his honor unto himself. In other words, you, you don't become a priest because you choose to. You are selected. Now, in the Levitical sense, you had to not only be a Levite, you had to be a son of Aaron, a descendant of Aaron. You didn't volunteer or train, well, you trained, but I mean, you didn't choose a career of being a priest. You either were or were not a priest. You with me? Okay. I mean, you, you didn't take this honor unto yourself. But he that is called of God, as Aaron was. Aaron was the first high priest, and he was called to that office. He didn't seek it. He probably didn't want it. And... Uh, he certainly didn't merit it, as we'll see. But he was appointed by God. The Aaronic priesthood, not to be confused with the priesthood that we're heading into. He's setting up a straw man here. We're going to talk about the Aaronic priesthood. That's what his readers were used to. And you need to understand the predicament of the, read, the reader to this epistle. Picture yourself alive after 32 AD before 70 AD. That's the window. You're Jewish. You've got divinely appointed people doing divinely appointed rituals in a divinely appointed place over there in the temple. And you're giving that all up. When you get baptized for Christ, you're shedding your Judaism, becoming Christian. Can you imagine how that was? How they were not accepted. They were persecuted. That's what they're chafing under. They're thinking about going back to Judaism. I'll get saved later <laughs> kind of thing. That's not an option. That's basically the theme here. Can they lose their salvation? Absolutely not. And it's a, pre it's a prelude to this whole discussion of eternal security that I'm not going to rebadger here except to make one point. And that is that if you, can, if you can lose your salvation, God loses more than you do because he loses his good name. Because God, Jesus said that no one can take them out of my hand. All that you, Father, all that you give me shall come to me and whosoever comes to me I will no wise cast out. No one can take them out of my hand. In the next verse, this is John 10, verse 28 and 29. No one can take him out of my father's hand. There are two hands involved. You can't get out of there if you tried. And I love to use Walter Bar a quote that I attribute to Walter Martin. If you, if you can lose your salvation, I got a new name for God. Butterfingers. And it's, it's an irreverent way of making a point perhaps, but your security is because of what Christ completed on the cross. He said, to tell us die, it is finished. So let's make sure that that's not a lingering concern. But there is a problem, and that's inheritance. Now Aaron was singled out by God in Exodus 16. He was officially called to the priesthood, priesthood in Exodus 28. He was reconfirmed in that office in number 17. Then he was challenged. Korah led a rebellion. And God sort of explained it to Korah a little more clearly. <laughs> he opened the earth and swallowed he and his followers up. King Saul attempted to take the role of a priest. Now, he's a king. He's not supposed to be. The king and the priest were separate. Kings were from Judah. Priests were from Levi. The idea was separate. King Saul got impatient waiting for Nathan to show up, so he, he started to perform his own sacrifice, and that led to God's rejecting him as king and the, and the anointing of David, 1 Samuel 13. When King Uzziah tried to burn incense, here's again a king intruding on the office of a priest. He got leprosy. God's making a point here. God takes himself very seriously. We need to also. 
So now shifting back to the text here. In, uh, so Christ also glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have I begotten thee. Where does he get that? Where is the writer quoting from here? Psalm 2, right? Jesus, our high priest, is mentioned in Psalm 2. He's, he's appointed high priest by whom? His father. Okay? Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And the, the psalm goes on. That's a quote from Psalm 2, 7. He had been mentioned twice before in this letter, and we may have touched on it then, but now we're getting into it. And he saith unto him in another place, again, now the quote, again, the writer isn't building his case on any personal authority. He's simply quoting from scriptures that are accepted by his readers. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That phrase is a strange phrase. The more you know about it, the stranger it is. So we're going to touch a little bit about the order of Melchizedek in contrast to the order of Aaron. It's a different priesthood altogether. This quote happens to come from Psalm 110, verse 4, and I want, I'm going to get into that tonight a little bit because I think it's a good review. But the Melchizedek priesthood is just a couple of verses in Genesis that are then echoed in Psalm 110 and picked up here for three chapters or more. And, and uh, it is the cornerstone of the entire epistle. It, it, it has few, and, uh, there are no other parallels to this anywhere in the New Testament, anywhere else in the New Testament. And it's, gonna, it's going to develop an estimate, a comparison between the two covenants, the Aaronic covenant and the, 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 Mes Mel uh, the uh, Melchizedek, I should say, the Aaronic priesthood and Melchizedek priesthood. And it's also going to do, a, then, that's going to lead to a contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the very thing that gives our Bible its names, New and Old Testament, if you will. But we're going to take a look at the two root things here. It's too important. Psalm 110, verse 4. Psalm 110 is one of the most interesting, shortest but most interesting psalms in the entire Old Testament. Verse 1 itself is quoted 25 times in the New Testament. And of those times, four of them are in, the, in this epistle. It gets worse than that. Verse 4, the Melchizedek verse, is quoted four times in the New Testament. In fact, the, in the epistle of Hebrews, there are ten quotes or allusions alone. Just in this, in, so it's, it's obviously a key reference to the writer here. Let's take a look at it while we're at it. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That verse Jesus used to put the lawyers to total confusion. I'll show you that in a minute. Jesus used that verse to put the lawyers to total confusion. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies confusion. He was under attack. The Herodians, that's the political party, tried to trap him by forcing him to make a political statement that would mark him as a traitor to Rome, and they failed doing that. Then the Sadducees stepped up. That's the liberals, if you will. They tried to trap him with a ridiculous question regarding the Mosaic Law, and they, they, they failed there. Then the Pharisees, that's they're the, 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 the conservatives, you might call them, tried to trap him, and Jesus' answer puzzled them. So while they're all trying to regroup, he says, let me ask a question. They all had their shot at it, right? And when you're dealing with these lawyers, you better know what you're doing, right? He said, let me ask you a question. And so this is all in Matthew 22. The Pharisees were gathered together, and Jesus asked them, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, well, son of David. They're no dummies. They knew that, right? Then Jesus said to them, how then doth David, in spirit, call him Lord, saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. He's quoting the first verse of Psalm 110. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? Well, that blew up. They, did, they murmured. Imagine they gnashed their teeth, whatever. Son of David. He, they knew he was son of David. That's all through 2 Samuel, all through the Psalms, lots of them, Micah 5 2. In fact, in Proverbs, it even shows up. Uh, 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 you know, what is his name? What is his son's name? If thou can tell, speaking of God in Proverbs 30. I won't start on that one here. Okay. No, I love this. I love this. No man was able to answer a word. <laughs> Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> so this is a well-known episode in Matthew 22 where he puts, let me show you, though, what the whole thing hangs on. 
If you look at the first verse of Psalm 110 in Hebrew, you'll discover yod heh vav -Hey, that's the name of, you know, the, 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 the Lord, the Lord. And, he, and it uses the term Adonai. In other words, the Lord said unto my Lord, Adonai, the whole key is a yod. That yod on Adonai makes it possessive. The Lord said unto my Lord. You see, the writer is indicating possession here. So when you translate it, see, we missed that because we're not trying really to translate it. The Lord said to my Lord, said that, Jesus said, okay, if you know that, if, okay, if, if the Messiah is, if Christ is the son of David, how can David say he's my Lord? This whole case that put them to total confusion is a yod. It's a little thing you and I would mistake for a, an apostrophe or something. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Think not that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets, I come not to destroy it, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law until I'll be filled. Now, yacht or tittle, the yacht is what is a little thing you and I would think is a blemish on the paper. A tittle is a little hook on some of the letters. But uh, anyway, okay, let's move on. The, le the next few verses of Psalm 110, Lord shall send a rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power and in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning until thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There is that quote that comes up again. Well, where does this Melchizedek first show up in the scripture? If it's just a little footnote, so to speak, on a battle. Genesis 14, the battle of the nine kings. Let's take a look at it. The fourteenth year came Sherdolomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims and Ashtaroth and Karnim and the Zemzumims and Ham and the Emims in Shavath Kiriathim. Which, by the way, most of these are what? Do you recognize those names? Nephilim, good for you. Several of the Rephaims, the, the Zemzumims, and the, those are ones that Joshua had the instructions to wipe out every man, woman, and child. But that's later, right? And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness, and they returned, came to another place I can't pronounce properly, and Mishapat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Malachites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in uh, Hazazon Tamar. Wow. And there went out from the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zaboim, and the king of Bela. These are rebels now. Uh, the same as Or, they joined the battle with them in the Vale of Siddim. And Chedalamar, the king of Elam, and with the title, the king of nations, and Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Elazar, four kings with five. And the Vale of Siddim was full of lime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. They took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals, and they went their way. In other words, the four rebelled against the the boss, and he took his five of his buddies and they wiped out the four, right? So, okay. But along the way, they made a big mistake. Because down in, when they wiped out Sodom, that gang, they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. From their point of view, that's a small footnote. But it was not a small footnote to his brother. Abraham was probably one of the richest men in the, in the world there at that time. So we have the Shemites, Amraphel, Arioch, Shedalamar, Tidal, and we had the Hamites against them, four against five. I had it backwards, by the way, because it was five. Five were the rebel rebels, because the Hamites were the rebels against Shedalamar. Very interesting list, by the way, because Shedalamar is the lead guy. He's the top dog. But he's not listed first over there. Amraphel, the king of Shinar, is. Why? He's not important now, but he's going to be important later, because that Shinar is essentially a synonym for Babylon. He'll become more important later, and that's, that's biblical lists are, you got to watch those. So these, these, this whole gang of nine served Sherlomer for 12 years, but in the 13th year, there was a rebellion of the Hamites. But Sherlomer successfully defeated and spoiled the rebels and took Lot, Abram's nephew, captive from Sodom. You with me so far? Okay. And became one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew. For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshkol, and the brother of Ener, and these were confederate with Abraham. So he had his buddies too, right? And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed, get this, he armed his trained servants born in his own house 
318 and pursued them unto Dan. Now, scholars are torn a little bit as to whether they were all born in this house literally or whether that just means they were trained under him. There's, a, there's, a, there's some linguistic issues behind all that. But the point is, he had his 318 guys that uh, uh, successfully went and rescued Lot. He divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them into Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also, think of that, and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return. Imagine he was impressed because Abraham pulled off what the king of Sodom couldn't. He brought, right? And out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Shadalamar and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheve, which is in at Kingsdale. Then we have this name show up out of nowhere. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, um, Zedek means righteousness. Melchi is king. Melchizedek is a title. He's the king of righteousness, and he's also the king of Salem. But he's also a priest. This is, now right away, if you're a student of the scripture, you're surprised, because here is a guy that is a king and a priest both. If you're familiar with your Bible, you know that Levites and Judah, they, they, you, know, you don't have kings and priests combined. There are only three people that are kings and priests. Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Jesus Christ will be a king and a priest. Who's the third? Probably sitting right here. Yeah, let's hope so. You betcha. God bless you. Yeah. And Melchizedek blessed him like a priest would and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Very unusual title for God, but I won't get into that here. And he blessed, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Abraham give him, gave him tithes. Okay? Abraham gives him tithes. That's going to be a big deal to the writer of Hebrews later. Because that proves that Melchizedek is superior to Abraham and Levi is yet born. He's still in the loins of Abraham. Therefore, Melchizedek priest is above a Levitical priest. Is the point the writer's going to make. It's a very rabbinical kind of point. But he's going to build on that little phrase. So Abraham's army, 318 trained servants, rescues Lot, okay. He's a Melchizedek king and a priest. He receives Abraham's tithes, and that's going to be emphasized in chapter 6 of, of Hebrews. And he administers bread and wine. Administers bread and wine. That's interesting. Where does that come up again? In Joseph's dream in Egypt. Remember, he's in prison. These other two, the, the wine steward and the baker are there and so forth. And out of that comes eventually, strangely, his redemption out of prison, right? Bread and wine instituted here, uh, echoed in the story of Joseph, which is a type of Christ in many ways, in over a hundred ways actually, and uh, of course is emblem, emblematic to you and I in what? The Lord's Supper, right? Doesn't say bread and grape juice, by the way. It's bread and wine. I just thought I'd mention that. Okay. And there are, of course, allusions to this not only in, he in Psalm 110, but in Hebrews chapters 5, 6, and 7. Melchizedek, king of righteousness and king of Salem. Salem is an old name for Jerusalem. Some authors, some authorities question that, but I think there's abundance of support that uh, what was then Salem later becomes Jerusalem. And he's also a priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek, very interesting guy. He received tithes. It's the only mentions of the ones that we've just looked at, and uh, it's going to be contrast to the Levitical priesthood. Melchizedek represents this. The Levitical priesthood, I put it this way, is a separation of both priesthood and kingship. When Reuben forfeits his birthright, his priestly role in the family goes to Levi, and his firstborn son status goes to Judah. So it gets split there, interesting enough. And the two elements by Melchizedek, I think, are fascinating. We could start on and on by that. But okay. Again, let's get back to Hebrews, believe it or not. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, was heard that he feared. And this, of course, is our high priest in view here. His request for deliverance was granted fully in his resurrection with his proclamation of the death defeated. You're looking at Gethsemane and all of that here. 
Melchizedek order. Even Abraham ties. He blessed Abraham. He was a type of the priest that lives forever. Or oh, the writer to Hebrews is going to make the point that Melchizedek in the biblical text has no parents and no death recorded. That doesn't mean he didn't die. There's just no death recorded. There's no birth because he's in there as a type. Okay? It's interesting that all through the scripture there are types of the bride of Christ. There's Ruth, the bride of Boaz, right? There's Eve, the bride of Adam. He's the first Adam, Christ the last Adam. You can go through every one of those in which the wife is a type of the church. There's seven of them. In none of them is their death recorded. Well, do you mean they didn't die? No, of course they died. But in model, they're, mo they're, they're presenting as a type the bride of Christ, which of course doesn't die. Follow me? So Melchizedek is a type. Many people get confused by that. We'll get to that too. See, Levi, even though he wasn't born yet, paid him tithes because he was in the, he's viewed as being in the loins of Abraham. And of course, the permanence of Christ's priesthood is implied by the abrogation of the Levitical system. That's what's going to come up here. Melchizedek was a priest without an, without an oath and without an end. Uh, not, excuse me, not without an oath and without an end. Priest can neither be transmitted or interrupted by death and so on. Okay, no record of birth or death by Melchizedek. Was he Shem? You'll find people, well, he was probably Shem. Shem was still alive and all that. No, because we know Shem's genealogy. That would, puncture the, that would puncture the type here. Was Melchizedek an Old Testament appearance of Christ? There are people that suggest that. No, because Christ's priesthood is after the order, after the similitude of Melchizedek. You can't be the type and be it together. It's a contradiction in terms. The Melchizedek, a celestial being of some kind. No, he's a man. That's what Hebrews 7 is going to bring out. So just take it for what he's a type. A mysterious type, but a fascinating type. And it's emphasis, that type is emphasized by the writer of Hebrews. In chapter 7, we're going to really get into this. The king of righteousness and peace all in Romans as well as Isaiah. His work will be righteousness and shall be peace. Righteousness, peace, and joy in Colossians. Made peace through the blood of Christ, justified by faith. See, Zedek, Melchizedek, is the, is the king of righteousness. As contrasted to Adonai Zedek. Adonai Zedek means the Lord of Righteousness, and he was the guy that was king of Jerusalem that created the alliance that Joshua has to put down. Joshua's adversary in the book of Joshua ultimately is Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness, is he, which is antithetical, of course. He's an antitype. He's a, in fact, he's a type, if you went to, of, of the Antichrist. And it's very, very interesting that uh, Joshua is facing seven Seven heads, huh? There were ten altogether because three were put down by Moses before Joshua took over. So there's ten but seven, and you can go through all that later. Okay, five contracts. Jesus has a better position. He's a better priest. He's a better priesthood because it's a better covenant. The priesthood is a better sanctuary and based on a better sacrament. The word better, 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 better is all through the book of Hebrews. So that is the background fabric of the writer, but that's not his main point. His main points are the warnings. He continues here, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Learned obedience? That throws a lot of people. He learned from the things that he suffered. It's a play on words in the Greek, from a Greek proverb that he learned by obedience, that he, the, he, 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 he obtained obedience. It doesn't mean that he learned. I'm not implying. Many people jump to all kinds of, of improper Christology from that. Christ didn't learn by obedience in the way we would think of that, in the English what that means. We wouldn't go that way. And being made perfect, he became the, sh the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Does that say eternal salvation? Well, if it's eternal, you can't lose it, can you? Let's not confuse ourselves, right? Okay. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Eternal salvation. Remember, Jesus said, to tell us die. It is finished. Can be translated paid in full. John 19. Now, the obedience that's addressed here is not the obedience of works because salvation is never by works. It's the obedience is the obedience of faith. And that's what he's talking about here uh, as we go through. And we'll get that. Now, what, all this is a buildup to a rebuke. The author develops the topic of the priesthood, but now he interrupts himself because he's going to say, you guys aren't ready for what I'm about to teach you. 
What I'm about to teach you is too advanced for you. Listen to this. He's going to give a preamble before he gets to warning number three. His warning is about stagnation. Your, I'm going to pretend you are the listeners of the epistle of Hebrew. Your failure to progress to spiritual maturity. That's what he's going to deal with here. There, it's going to be the third of five warnings. I want to remind you once again, all warnings are a unit. They go together and complement each other. Each builds upon the other. Each intensifies until the final fifth one. And each of these rely heavily on Israel's exodus as the example for us as individual Christians. Paul wrote in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning. Well, this is, this is going to lean heavily on those Old Testament examples. The exodus generation was a redeemed people. They never went back to Egypt, they, but they failed to he, fe, heed God's instruction and therefore were judged by being disinherited. All were written to believers, all five of these. They did not represent a loss to the past aspect of salvation, that is justification. The warnings represent the very real possibility of the loss of privileges or rewards offered to the believer, which will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. That's really what we're all talking about here. What's at stake? What are these believers going to lose? Forfeit or suffer? Not salvation. Rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And you cannot escape this by trying to apply it to others. The burden of Hebrews is not the rescuing of sinners from hell. It's the bringing of sons to glory. That's the burden of this book. Five major warnings. We have the danger of drifting when we're in chapter 2. We have the danger of disobedience introduced in chapter 3 through 4. We're now going to be in an area where it's the progress to maturity that's the issue. And he's going to highlight as a going in position the peril of being dull of learning and dull of hearing and dull of learning and dull of, prog and dull of progress. There are 16 different views of the problem verse I'm going to show you tonight. 16 different views. Then we're going to have two others later on as we get in the epistle. We're going to go from the danger of disobedience, which is the last one, to the progress towards maturity. Let's look, starting at verse 11. The writer says, Of whom we have many things to say, speaking of Christ and all of this, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. You notice how tactful he is of his audience? Yeah. Doesn't sound seeker-friendly, does it? Of whom? And of course, the of whom is Melchizedek and the order of Melchizedek, namely Jesus Christ. And the writer cl clearly states that his readers are in no condition to receive the subsequent teaching. You guys are not ready for what's coming. That's where I'm going to leave it for the next session. <laughs> he calls them immature, backward, untaught, dull of hearing. That's what, he's, that's, what, that's what he's calling his listeners. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, not of strong meat. And he's going to continue. Have need of milk. And he's talking about you guys are, you know, you should be teaching, but you need to be taught the first principle, the ABCs, if you will. So he's really accusing them of regression, failing to advance. The problem is the topics that are coming belong to the category of strong food, not milk. He divides it in two categories, milk, that's for infants, and strong meat or strong food for the, to grow on. You're not ready for that. You're still on milk, is he? He's going to develop all that in chapter 7 going on, but he's saying, you guys aren't ready to go on. Why? You need to develop spiritually in order to show the ability and teaching instead of being retaught the same things over and over again. I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you are tired of going to church and hearing the same things over and over and over again? I know some of you are saying the same thing here. I keep reviewing too much at the first of each session. <laughs> No, but I, I can remember when I was at the Naval Academy, we, you didn't have to go to the chapel. You could sign up for what we call church parties and go to one of the churches. And it was a way to sample different churches out in town. But you signed up for a semester, so you were stuck for that for the semester. And it was a way of sampling, and I tried several churches for change. And I, uh, there was this one Baptist church. And it was a great church, nice pastor. But every Sunday morning was an altar call. Every Sunday morning was a, a sermon to the unbeliever to accept Christ. Now, that's great but not every Sunday. You know what I'm saying? I remember that I was grateful when I could sign up for another church party. I just got tired of that message. I could, you know, anyway. Stronger food. The milk of the word 
is what Jesus did on earth. His birth, his life, his teaching, his death, his burial, resurrection. The meat of the word refers to what he's doing now in heaven and on. And this is all going to be developed in chapter 7 as we go on. But let's continue with chapter 5 here. The writer says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. If you're in that category, you're babes, he's saying. What do you mean by the word of righteousness? See, we only grow on stronger food. As long as you're a believer fails to go beyond the basics, you'll remain a baby. That's what he's saying. Now I'll just insert that. How about you? Are you still babies? I don't think so. You wouldn't be here tonight. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You really don't know a topic till you teach it. That's the other implication here. Full age, the word is teleos, which means complete or mature. Strong meat belongs to the mature. All believers are to make proper use of what they know. There's two concepts here. Stronger food and using what you know. Not just listening and filling notebooks with notes, but passing on, teaching. All of you should be either in or certainly teaching a small group somewhere. Think about it. You use it or you lose it, Scripture says. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. And then he lists a bunch of basics. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works or the faith toward God. Leave, in other words, he doesn't leave the babyhood in milk, press on to maturity. The danger is if they don't, they will make an irreversible decision that will permanently keep them in a state of spiritual immaturity, and we'll get to that. Again, the foundation. What is he talking about these foundation things? These are foundational truths. Repentance from the dead, works, faith toward God. And the doc doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Of this, we will do if God permit. Okay. See, we're going to go on to perfection, hopefully, after these mere basics. Wait a minute. What are those mere basics? Well, two, they're in pairs. There's, three, there's six of them listed. Two are conversion ones. Repentance from dead works. That's a reference to the Levitical system, which was temporary and came to an end with the death of the Messiah. Once the Messiah died, it should have been over. And finally it was, even the temple is gone. That's the, that's the predicament of Judaism today. They know that the, the Torah teaches that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, and they have no place they can shed blood. They got a problem. So they redefined it all in the, 90th, in the Council of Yomnia later. But anyway, and the second one was faith toward God. Now once and for all turning to the Messiah, positive commitment. Bear in mind, he's talking to Jews with their, from their basic ABCs. Next one is ceremonial elements, baptisms. They were used to immersions. The critical one was the immersion that we call baptism. They're, they're, they're uh, t taking an identity with Christ. And the ceremonial, the reason it's plural is the ceremonial cleansing of the political systems are in view. And that's going to be dealt with in, in Hebrews chapter 9. And so the, to a Jewish believer, baptism marked the final point of their separation from Judaism. And that's what they're chafing under. They're thinking about going back. Big mistake. That's what he's trying to try to get across here. And the laying on of hands. And that's the, in the Old Testament, the way of imparting blessings and also appointing someone to an officer work. It's also used all through the New Testament in a very similar way. So that's familiar to us. And the last couple are eschatological ones. Resurrection from the dead, which of course is an Old Testament doctrine, not just New Testament. It's in Job 19, verse 25. Isaiah 26, Daniel 12, etc. And uh, also the eternal judgment, which of course is the great white throne and the lake of fire and all of that. So those are the six foundational beliefs. If you have those six, you're still a babe, according to the writer. Wow. That should be disturbing. Disturbs me. So that leads to a primary riddle. Comes the primary challenges in the entire New Testament is about to confront you. You ready for this? Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. Here's the way it reads. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted for the heavenly gift, tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Let's pause there. Are, are those people saved? Those that were once enlightened, have tasted of the heavenly gift, that were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, are they saved? Are these people saved? Absolutely. And have tasted of the good word of God and powers of the world to come? And by the way, it's really that, that's a phrase, the word ion in world there is singular, not plural. If it's worlds, plural, it's worlds. When it's singular, it should be it's the time domain. It's the millennium that it's talking about. But that's, that's not a big deal here. Let's go on. 
if those people, it's impossible for them, if they fall away and renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Wow. A lot of people read that and say, gee, these are believers, and if they do these things, whatever they are, they can never again repent. Wow. Sounds like you, that sounds like you lose your salvation. This is quoted by people, good scholars, that uh, uh, you can lose your salvation. This is one of the offsetting texts to the typical, right? Major riddle. Weren't these believers? They were once enlightened. They tasted the heavenly gift. They were partaking of the Holy Ghost. They tasted the good word of God and the powers of the coming age, the millennium. They tasted that. Boy, incidentally, not only were they saved, it doesn't sound like they were babes either. Sound like a little more than that maybe. In any case, can these readers lose their salvation is a question. Turn your papers in when you've got your answer. And we'll... How does this passage impact your views of eternal security? How do you, do you ignore it? What do you do? What do you do with this? If you're in, a, if you're in a home Bible study and one of your people challenges you, what about Hebrews 6? What are you going to say? Well, they maybe not really weren't believers, or maybe they were only partial, or maybe it's partial rapture. Or, you, know, you got all these conjectures. There are 16 different interpretations of this passage in the, among the commentators. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gifts and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again into repentance, boy, apparently they can lose their salvation. If they fall away, it would be impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. Oh, boy. I know Catholics that crucify Christ every ma at every Mass. They take, you know, that's what it's supposed to be in the Mass, right? And, 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 and so on. Well, for your next session. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I want you to read carefully Numbers 14 one more time. It may have some surprises for you. Study carefully. Hebrews chapter 6, that's what we've gone through. And I want you for the next time to formulate your own analysis of this passage and explain how it impacts your perspective of eternal security. And many of you right now are really grateful that you're not taking this course for credit. <laughs> there are 16 different views, and we're not going to go through all of them, but we will give you the core of the issue. And we'll give you at least one answer. It may not be the right answer, but we'll give you an answer that seems to have been missed by all the classical commentators that I've seen. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you for who you are, and we thank you that you have brought us to this very point in time. We know that there are no coincidences in your kingdom, that we're all here by your divine appointment. So, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, for your word that you've opened to our hearts and lives. But above all, Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, by whose shed blood we have the opportunity to approach you. We thank you not only for his gift on that cross, but we thank you that he ever liveth to make intercession for us, that he is alive right now pleading our behalf. Oh, what a high priest we have. What a high priest we have. And Father, as we struggle with passages that seem to confuse or seem to contradict our understanding, we pray, Father, for your discernment through your Holy... You've promised, Father, that the Comforter would teach us all things, not just a few, all things. Well, Father, we would just ask that you would use this verse that we've stumbled on tonight as a key to understanding. 
what you have here for us. That it isn't a little problem that we stub our toe on, but rather it's a door or a window into a whole body of truth that you would have us apprehend. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for where we are. We ask you to help us outgrow our infancy, help us to progress to spiritual maturity, not by power nor by might, but by your spirit. As we commit ourselves without any reservations whatsoever into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our high priest who died for us. Amen.